very warm welcome to everybody uh, for this amazing webinar that we take our time to speak about the relations between debt, colonialism and climate justice. We are, um, uh, one second, we have a problem with the recording apparently. I have it in Spanish at least, one second. Um, give me one second. Does everybody have a problem to record? No, okay. Yes. Christopher, I can see you recording. So I think I have to make you co-host. Sorry, I will just take a second to do this. Otherwise we're gonna lose the... Mm -mm. Yes, let's see. Ines, is it working now? Just gonna make a bunch of people co-hosts. Perfect, okay, for Ines it's working Then I'm just doing it for the French people as well. Mm. And the other one, French, was on. Yes. Okay, so I, I think now we're set with the recording. So welcome everybody again. Um, we from Debt for Climate are hosting this webinar today and Christopher and myself are going to be um, the facilitators of this meeting. Uh, I just want to make a little disclaimer that I would ask everybody to be kind to each other, especially in the discussion, to be respectful and try to find a reflective position um, on your respective positions um, in regards to any kind of privilege and biases that may, may come with that, be it due to your gender, race or class background so that we can have a pleasant space to discuss uh, and one that is based on mutual respect. Um, so this event takes place just one day after the International Day of in Indigenous Resistance that reminds the world of the beginning of the colonization of Abia Yala, also known as Latin America. It also takes place while the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are meeting in Washington. So two global financial institutions who play a major role in the perpetuation of colonial relations um, today of unequal exchange, particularly using um, debt as a tool of systematic domination and exploitation under the guise often of developmental aid. This means that they also play a major role in accelerating the climate crisis, although this is a role for which they are less known, but we today and also as Debt for Climate um, cast light on exactly this connection. We have today three amazing speakers who will help us to navigate those quite difficult and complex waters. And I'm extremely happy and grateful for your time and expertise. Um, just for everybody to know, the webinar is divided more or less into five sections. We will start with a problem analysis, like where does that come from? Why are countries of the global south so indebted? And then we go to the question of what we can actually do about it and what all of this has to do with climate. Uh, justice or injustice um, and then we go to asking the question so what would the world actually look like if we are successful with our demand of debt cancellation then we as moderation take the freedom to ask three questions that we have been asked as that for climate quite a couple of times so that we have the opportunity to get some official answers to them and then we will open the floor to all of you participants um, to ask questions to our beautiful um, panelists and that's it, I think, from my side. And then I'll pass it on to you, Christopher. Thank you. And I have the great pleasure to briefly introduce the three experts we have on board for today. Um, and we have two, uh, I would say, leading economists on uh, this question. Dongo Sambasilla, who is a development economist based in Dakar in Senegal, where he currently works as a senior research and program manager at the West Africa office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. And Dongo has authored and edited a number of books on the political economy of debt in the global south, on the CFA franc currency, and on revolutionary movements in Africa, among other topics. So uh, I think it's fair to say that we are very privileged to have you on board. Thank you for joining us today, Dongo. And Dr. Fadel Kaboub is president of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity and associate professor of economics at Denison University in the US. 
and while Fadel may be best known as uh, an expert on modern monetary theory and the Green New Deal and the job guarantee, uh, his work especially focuses on how countries in the global south can achieve economic and monetary sovereignty and how they can use that to build resilience and promote sustainable prosperity. So also to you, Fadel, uh, big welcome. Thank you for joining us. And finally, we have Esteban Servat, who is not only a scientist and environmental activist from Argentina, who uh, comes from really the front lines of the fight against fracking, and then went on to found not only Echo Leaks, but also co-initiate uh, co that for climate. So if anyone can explain to you what this movement is all about, it's Esteban. So thanks also to you for joining us. So let's start um, with a question to Fadel and Dongo and take a brief look um, in total at about 10 minutes to how we came to this problem. How did countries in the global south become indebted in the first? first place and how did this turn into a crisis and why would you argue that some or even all of this debt is illegitimate and what are the very concrete consequences of this debt for people in those countries uh thank you i'll i'll, I'll go ahead and, and start um uh, first by thanking you christopher luis uh, esteban and, and all the interpreters uh working in the in the background for for hosting us and for facilitating this important conversation um to summarize you know how we got here into this debt trap external debt trap and i emphasize when i say external debt it's debt denominated in foreign currencies dollars euros british pounds and and so on as opposed to debt denominated in a national currency of a, a developing country that's that's a, a separate issue that's that can be managed it's not the same uh debt trap so developing countries countries in the global south typically struggle with three structural traps and these are the colonial neo-colonial traps that we'll be discussing today uh, when you look at the origins of the external debt you realize that it comes from structural trade deficits. And the trade deficits are concentrated in three major areas. The first one is the lack of food sovereignty. Uh, Africa today imports 85% of its food, and this is before the Ukraine crisis. Um, the most fertile land on the planet, and it's not by accident, uh, and it's not strictly related to climate change and droughts, so that, that is part of the problem. But there are other issues that I'll come back to later to explain how in the early days of independence, post-colonial uh, independence, there were traps that are essentially set up to force developing countries into uh, losing food sovereignty and, and food security. So that's the first component, uh, structural trade deficits related to food imports. Number two, structural trade deficits related to energy imports. And that is also true for the biggest oil exporters in the global south, because they export crude oil and re-import the more refined petrochemical versions of it, gasoline, kerosene, and diesel, and, and other petrochemical products, um, let alone for the countries that don't have the energy resources to begin with. And then the third component is a type of industrialization that forced the global south essentially to specialize in purely extractive industries such as mining or very low value added manufacturing in other words assembly line manufacturing so you import the capital you import the intermediate goods you import the energy uh, you import the technology and you use low cost labor in a global race to the bottom to assemble components for a global supply chain to be consumed typically in the richest countries and in, in, in the global uh, north. So you take these three components, you put them together, you have a permanent structural trade deficit, which does the following. And this is really the part that activists and organizers who join us in this struggle really need to understand this connection. When you have a trade deficit, it weakens the value of your currency relative to the dollar, relative to the euro. 
And with the weaker currency, everything you import the next morning, whether it's food or medicine or fuel, is going to be more expensive, which means you're literally importing inflation. So what do you do when you import inflation related to food and fuel and medicine? You're pretty much facing potential food riots the next morning. So what do countries do to intervene in a band-aid type of solution to, to prevent social unrest? Governments intervene by subsidizing food imports, subsidizing fuel imports, and to artificially fix the exchange rate or stabilize the exchange rate at an artificially higher level relative to the dollar and to the euro. And that fixing of the exchange rate and stabilization of the exchange rate means you have to borrow dollars and euros and British pounds in order to artificially strengthen your currency. And that external borrowing starts the debt trap because the next year you have to do it again. And the following year you have to do it again because it's a structural trap, which means not only you have to pay the external debt, but you have to acquire even more and pay more in principal and interest, which means you're never getting out of that debt trap. And then you're told, in order to pay your debts and be a good global citizen to pay your bills on time, you need to do a number of things to redesign the priorities of your economy, to earn more dollars and euros to get out of that debt trap. So the list sounds like economic solutions. And these are typically the things that the IMF and the World Bank and all major international organizations will tell you, this is how you get out of the structural debt trap. But in fact, these are even deeper structural traps. I'll give you examples. They tell you tourism is a good way to create millions of jobs and earn foreign currency reserves to pay your bills. Well, it turns out when you bring five, six, seven million tourists to your country, you have to feed them, so you import even more food. You have to transport them and heat and cool the hotels, so you have to import even more fuel. And you have to import high quality equipment to have the nicest hotels and resorts so you end up adding to your structural debt trap while thinking that you're actually getting out of the trap. Um, they tell you you need to accelerate your exports, encourage more exports. So what do you do? You subsidize exporters. You lower your tax rates. Um, but what your exporters are doing are, again, importing capital, importing more fuel to fuel the new industries and using low cost labor and lower environmental standards in a global race to the bottom and get you deeper in that trap. So all the solutions of bringing in foreign direct investment, using remittances, that is brain drain in other words, all of these classic mainstream solutions are actually getting you deeper in that structural trap. So that's where we are today. In other words, this is a continuation of the original colonial relations moving into a neo-colonial era that uh, leads us into where we are today with these permanent debt crises in, in the global south that rearrange the priorities of all of these countries in the global south to do whatever is needed by the global economy, by the global north, in order to serve the global supply chain, in order to extract more natural resources to feed either the old economy of fossil fuels or the new economy of the renewable energy systems in an extractivist uh, economic model that doesn't serve the priorities of the economies to invest in food sovereignty, invest in renewable energy sovereignty, invest in a different kind of industrialization that retains higher value added within the global south. Uh, so these are kind of the, the initial uh, thoughts that I have. And, and Dongo maybe will, will give us a little bit more specifics related to um, uh, countries in, in the neighborhood related to the CFA franc uh, actual colonial currency that persists to this day. I just jump in quickly. Uh, that would indeed be interesting. Um, and Dongo, feel free to add that um, with an eye on the time, uh, maybe just briefly. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Fadel and Christopher. It's really great to be here among you. Uh, I would agree with um, uh, Fadel. I mean, this uh, uh, debt in foreign currency uh, summarizes the whole pattern of dependency of the, from the global south vis-a-vis -vis the, the global north. And uh, this dependency 
uh, has clear colonial origins. Uh, and um, one, one, one approach is the, for example, the Ojo's depth approach. And I mean, it allows to explain why you have, uh, I mean, this uh, structural uh, pattern of uh, external indebtedness. Uh, many, uh, I mean, post-colonial, post-independence governments, uh, when they obtained their independence, they were obliged to uh, service uh, debt contracted by colonial governments. And those debts were obviously odious in the sense that they were uh, contracted uh, by undemocratic governments. Uh, they were used not for public purpose. And uh, those who, I mean, the lenders knew very well that uh, the loan they extended would not used for, for public purpose. So uh, colonialism uh, created odious debt, uh, which um, uh, which uh, uh, was associated with long-term economic effects. And the best example of that is IET. And we are uh, seeing uh, many demands for reparations for what IET went through once it obtained its independence in the beginning of the 19th century. The other aspect, uh, uh, besides obvious debt, is what Fadel said. Is the um, I mean the technology, technological and financial dependency. Uh, you know, during colonialism, uh, the monetary systems were organized in a way that benefited uh, colonial extractivism. And the best example of that is the uh, CFA franc countries in uh, I mean Central Africa, in West Africa. That means their monetary and financial systems uh, were designed in a way that only benefited. I mean, uh, the, the, the metropoles, and not really, I mean, the benefit of the populations, I mean, for, for internal accumulation, I, I would say, for creating domestic prosperity. And this created a, a debt dynamic uh, because, uh, well, you could have been a food self-sufficient, but you will never be because this was not of interest for the metropolis. You could have been energy self-sufficient, but this is not possible. You could have uh, south-south trade, but it's not possible because that was not, I mean, the aim of the colonial system. So uh, those patterns are still uh, with us at uh, varying degrees. And this financial, I mean, uh, I mean, dependency is also associated with a kind of technological dependency, because if you do not uh, use your financial system to, uh, I mean, to finance, I mean, worthwhile projects to stimulate your own prosperity, you will be dependent on foreign technologies. But foreign technologies, equipments, and so on have to be acquired in um, foreign currency. So that means that if your development is modeled, uh, I mean, around, I mean, is based on foreign resources, foreign real resources, you will have this need to issue debt, I mean, in, um, I mean, permanently, or at least to see your economy uh, uh, dominated by foreign capital, for example, for direct investment. So that means that this debt issue is structural, as um, Fadel said, due to historical reasons associated with colonialism to the extent that it created structures of uh, financial technological dependency, uh, which uh, I mean explains this, um, I mean this, uh, I mean continue uh, external indebtedness of the global south. Right, so we hear that there's really a kind of vicious cycle between this structural unequal trade and the debt itself. Now, Esteban, where, does climate enter the picture? How is both this structural unequal trade and the debt itself related to the problem we face on the climate front? Well, can you hear me okay? You know, Christopher, I was listening to Fadel and Dongo and how this uh, describes perfectly what's happening in my country, in Argentina. Um, Argentina, Fadel was talking about food insecurity. We are one of the major producers of food in the world. We produce food for nearly 10 times our population in terms of numbers, and yet we cannot feed our own people. Nearly 50% of the population is below the poverty line and experiencing hunger or, or food, uh, uh, but, but uh, nutrition one way or another. So this is part of the coloniality of what they were talking about. And along with that comes also the sacrifice of the rural communities to the extractive industries, <clears throat> such as fracking, which is one I know very well because I come from there in Vaca Muerta, 
uh, such as mega mining, such, such as offshore drilling, such as deforestation to continue expanding the soybean and, and Monsanto frontier to export soybeans to, um, to China so they can feed their pigs with it. And so what we're seeing right now is that Argentina is basically sacrificing its entire countryside population to be able to pay the interest on the loan, which is a record loan by the IMF, the biggest in its history, totally illegitimate, breaking their own statute to award it to President, right-wing President Macri under pressure from Trump to help him win the re-election but that the new progressive government, so-called progressive, is actually legitimized and is using the countryside, destroying the rural communities and fueling climate change through this extractivism to be able to pay back the interest on these loans. And I think Argentina is just a great example of what goes on all over the world, all over the global south. The more resource rich the countries are, the more indebted and poor they tend to be and that is the key player, the key, the key element in this game to keep the global north, provide the global north with all these raw materials, minerals, oil and gas and so on, and keep us poor and keep us extracting more and more without benefiting anyone in the population and fueling the climate crisis to unprecedented levels. Right, I understand that that really is one of the key reasons why countries are trapped into this extractivist mode of, of production. And that is why you and others have started this movement, Debt for Climate. But how do you imagine that such a movement can actually mobilize different groups and call for the power shift and bring about the power shift that is necessary to end this global debt relation? Well, it, it came, um, it's a campaign that we started from the Global South, started with comrades in Argentina and then from all over the world. And what we came to realize is that, you know, we've been fighting fracking for many years and it's only getting worse. Vaca Muerta is the world's second largest shale gas basin, fourth largest shale oil basin. It's about the size of Belgium and it's a major carbon bomb for the planet that will consume a huge amount of the global carbon budget. And yet it is the European and Global North multinational companies that are exploiting Vaca Muerta, where they can, most of them cannot do it in their own countries to do fracking. And yet they send them to us to extract this. Um, this is happening. There is hundreds of carbon bombs, climate bombs, many of them located in the Global South, trillions of dollars of fossil fuels in the ground that continue to be extracted and the fossil fuel frontier expanded to be able to pet this debt. So while many of our countries have signed the Paris Agreement and are signing all these commitments on paper, the reality is the, the complete opposite because of the debt as a coercive mechanism to further expand uh, the fossil fuel frontier and the mining and other extractive industries. So what we came to realize is that in order to be able to tackle this extractivism, we need to build a coalition that is broader than what we have already done before. This is not enough with one local groups of uh, anti-fracking movements like we did in Vaca Muerta, but that we need to incorporate other sectors of society, especially the working class. And the working class, I've been working in Europe since I came here three years ago, and I also noticed this divide between the working class and the climate movements, which are usually blamed or accused of being very white and privileged, and it's true. And they want to connect to the working class, but it's always very difficult to do that. So what we realize is that for strategic reasons, we need to build a global grassroots coalition that can speak to the workers at a time when also in Europe you see a dangerous path a dangerous tendency to alienate the workers from the climate activists because of the food, um, the cost of living crisis and so on. But we also understand that in order to make any of what Fadela and Dongo were describing change, we need to build power on the streets from the bottom up. And we need to build a global movement that connects the extraction sites with the global north consumption ends, also where the companies are located, the centers of power are. We need a global movement that has international internationalism and international solidarity at heart and is working for the survival and the benefit of us all. So we realize that when we tackle debt, we can speak to the workers and the workers get it. I know in Europe, it will be a tougher thing to do. It will not be as easy, but in the global South, debt is the knee on the neck 
that is affecting the workers' capacity to feed their families, to have a decent life, is directly affecting them. So it's no longer just speaking about fracking or just speaking about mining, which oftentimes you will not be able to get them on board because they are being promised jobs by those industries. But by tackling that, you're not tackling their jobs. You're not targeting them. You're actually targeting something where they have power to fight together against financial colonialism. And that way, we've been able to bring uh, huge uh, worker movements, especially in Argentina, where thousands have been mobilizing and some of the biggest labor unions in the country. To, um, Friday is going to be, we're doing another global action now from this week until COP. So uh, Argentina will mobilize on Friday and it's also going to have thousands of workers. This is unprecedented to have the workers taking uh, protagonism in a climate fight. And we think that building a bridge like this is really important also with the indigenous communities. Uh, yesterday, about 10,000 indigenous people mobilized in Paraguay. So we need to, to connect indigenous movements and uh, workers and climate activists and social activists globally to be able to put the necessary pressure and do what Thomas Sankara was calling for, a united front against debt. But we need you, we need you in Berlin, we need you in, in Paris, in Brussels, in London, in Washington, DC, putting pressure and amplifying what people in the global south can do by mobilizing the mobilizing can go nowhere unless we can also hit these centers of power to actually impact the IMF, the World Bank, and the governments that control them. So maybe let's suppose for a moment this movement is successful and we do hit the powers, the central powers, and we get the IMF and the World Bank to cancel the debt. What exactly would this enable in the countries of the global, global south? What possibilities would this open up? Maybe, Dongo, let's let's imagine what uh, countries in Africa could and maybe could not do if uh, substantial portions or all of the debt were actually cancelled. Uh, thanks, Christopher, for this uh, issue, uh, for this question. And what I could say at the outset is that um, it is important to make a distinction between the, um, the debt stock, uh, uh, outstanding debt stock and the uh, debt system in itself. Uh, when uh, we talk about cancelling the, the, the debt, we are talking generally about cancelling the outstanding debt stock. Uh, the thing is, uh, if you cancel the outstanding debt stock, and I, yeah, I am favorable to that, yeah, you, you see, that will not be enough. I mean, that would just relieve populations from austerity measures, but that would, would not fundamentally change the current extractivist orientation of development you have in the global south because as we said the debt is the symptom of what is wrong it is not itself the cause of the i mean the underdevelopment etc it is a symptom of what is wrong so the thing is to cancel to abolish the debt system in itself and this was i mean uh, said eloquently by um, Fadel Kabup, the free trade policies, uh, uh, I mean, uh, financial liberalization, etc. If you do not address that, even if you cancel the existing debt stock, uh, external debt stock, this would not change much. It, this would just relieve populations from, I mean, more austerity. Uh, that will mean that that would imply that you are given, I mean, a new breath to this extractivist, uh, I mean, model in the global south, and that's actually what Africa went through with the partial cancellation of, I mean, of official uh, external debt uh, during the early 2000s. You see, but this does not change much because the debt was quickly the debt stock was quickly reconstituted. The other thing also. Um, to be said is that the cancelling the existing debt stock has never been an issue of affordability for the global north never because most of the global north countries are monetarily sovereign and you know when you uh, happen to read mmt modern monetary theory you know that as long as real resources are available affordability is not an issue uh, and if you look at the existing uh, uh, debt stock for the i mean for the countries the world bank call of course, uh, the low and middle income countries, we have 136 of them. If you exclude China, Russia, and India, which are part of them, their uh, uh, external public and publicly uh, guaranteed debt stock, external debt stock, 
uh, amounted to 2.6 trillion US dollar in, uh, I mean, 2020. And you know, that year, the governments of the, uh, the OECD governments, uh, they issued on markets uh, sovereign bonds of an amount of 18 trillion US dollar, just that year, 18 trillion dollar. While the existing debt stock, I mean public and publicly guaranteed foreign debt stock of the 133 low and middle income countries was just 2.6 trillion. That means lower than even the uh, uh, current debt stock of the uh, Canada uh, Canadian federal government. So that means that affordability is not an issue. The issue is are they willing, the governments of the global north and the institutions, are they willing, uh, I mean, uh, to drop this instrument of, I mean, domination? I think that's, that, that's the issue. They are not willing, uh, I mean, to drop this instrument of, the, uh, of, of domination, but to uh, cancel the current debt stock, it has never been an issue of afford affordability. And one thing, one last thing I would like to say is that in the case of Africa, we have been much more suffering uh, from the profit and dividend repatriation by foreign tech investment than from servicing the debt, the external debt. This also has to be said. And I actually, uh, this pattern of, I mean, exporting your economic surplus is one of the fundamental reasons why African countries need to issue debt in foreign currency. So if you just attack the centum, I will, you will leave the whole problem, I mean, uh, I mean, without addressing its, uh, its, its, uh, its root causes. Thank you. No, thank you. I think these are two really important insights that debt cancellation is affordable for the global north, but it's only a first step and uh, maybe a springboard to broader structural changes, including profit repatriation. At the same time, isn't it true that debt cancellation could actually increase the monetary sovereignty of those countries? And maybe Fadel, Maybe you can uh, reply to this. Is it true that the fiscal space, the capacity of governments to fund things like uh, food sovereignty or energy sovereignty could already benefit from the cancellation of the foreign debt? Uh, very good question. And I completely agree with Ndongo that debt cancellation is important. It's one step in the right direction but there's much, much broader uh, issues that need to be addressed structurally. Uh, I always start with, with one data point. If we net out global financial transactions between rich countries and poor countries, just two groups, that includes international trade, interest payments, debt cancellation, uh, foreign aid, everything. The net amount, the, the last numbers we have, is $2 trillion moving from the global south to the global north. That's the extractive nature of the global financial and international trade architecture. That number, when I first started paying attention to this, when I was a student about 20 years ago, was about $500 billion. And then it became a trillion, and then 1.5, and now it's 2 trillion. So we can cancel all the debt today, but don't do anything about the global finance and international trade architecture. I guarantee you in a few years, the number will climb back up to the exact same amount and, and beyond. So to put this in the context of, uh, of the climate crisis and what needs to be done, uh, globally to invest in food sovereignty, renewable energy sovereignty, to transform the way we produce and consume and transport things to, to deal with the climate crisis. We need to have a, a very clear timeline in terms of the level of intervention and how quickly we need to intervene. So if you, if you look at the, product, the production gap report, which uh, the UN commissioned a few years ago, and the, the report was updated recently, uh, it's very simple picture that comes out of that report, which is how much the world is planning to extract and burn in terms of fossil fuels uh, in the next few decades. And this is not just forecasting. This is actually signed, sealed, and delivered numbers confirmed by the major oil and gas and coal companies. This is what countries are planning to extract and burn versus how much we're actually allowed to extract and burn to meet the climate challenge at the 1.5 degree limit or the two degree limit. And we are currently on track to burn through that budget to exceed the 1.5 limit by the uh, by 2030. We're on track to extract and burn twice as much as we're allowed. By 2040, we're on track to extract and burn burn almost four times as much as as our budget. So at this pace, we're we're accelerating 
moving towards the the cliff as as a globe. So we need to not only stop uh, the the addition of oil and gas infrastructure, but have to massively transform the way we do this in the global north primarily. And this is where degrowth matters. But also things have to be done in the global south. We can remove all electric, uh, all you know, fossil fuel based uh, vehicles in the global north today. But if we don't have a plan to provide uh, clean public transportation, both in the global north and the global south, we're going to shift those all those vehicles to be you know burning fossil fuels in the global south for the next 20 years. Because so far, I haven't heard any major plan that says this is what we're going to do with these vehicles that we're taking off the streets from, from Europe, from the United States. It's clearly that we're shifting the emissions somewhere else. So in terms of restructuring the global financial architecture, Take into account that $2 trillion number that's been extracted from the global south. About 10 years ago, when the world met and said, yes, there's climate change. Yes, we need to do something about it. Yes, we need to help the global south. There was a commitment to put $100 billion in a global green fund every year. And that was more than 10 years ago. Last time I checked, about a week ago, there was only $10 billion in that fund. So imagine this, I tell you I'm going to help you deal with this problem, and I promise to give you 100 every year, and instead, I only provide 10. But what I didn't tell you is that I'm taking $2 trillion from you every year, right? There's something fundamentally wrong about the system, and we're accelerating towards global extinction. By 2030, by 2040, we're going to burn through that limit. So if we're not first canceling the debt, and number two, repairing the damage and repairing those broken structures, replacing the engine of the global economy that produces the pollution, produces the socioeconomic exclusion, that produces and reproduces the colonial and neocolonial traps, we're not going anywhere. So first, cancel the debt. That, that's the first part of the relief. You can call it climate debt. You can call it colonial, neocolonial debt. You can call it uh, odious debt. All of these legal principles exist and can be activated. Number two, we have to reverse the flow of those $2 trillion, which means we have to undo the neocolonial structures that were established in 1945 when the Bretton Woods institutions were established, the IMF and the World Bank. The Global South was not invited to the table to decide how we establish this global financial architecture, partly because most of the Global South was under imperial control as colonies. So we need to recognize this. We live in a colonially established global financial system that was not designed to benefit the people of the global south. Let's be very clear about this. So that needs to change. So the three traps that I described, you have to start by plugging those holes that you have in your economy. First, invest in food sovereignty, not food security, because food security means somehow you can buy the stuff from somewhere. Food sovereignty means you actually control the whole process. And most countries in the global south, you used to have very high degrees of food sovereignty, if not capacity actually to export to the global north. So here's one of the things that was done immediately. As soon as African countries became independent, the former imperial powers met in Rome and Europe and said, we need to do something about our own food security in the global north. We're going to start investing in our own food sovereignty. And you hear it even today in this uh, global food crisis, the, the French Minister of Agriculture is, is talking to the French people saying, don't worry, we have food sovereignty. We invested in this from the 1960s. That's why we have the common agricultural policy, which Europe introduced, which was designed to heavily subsidize European agribusiness in order to outcompete the global south. The US did the same, Japan did the same, Australia, the Soviet Union, which is Russia and the Ukraine, which is why we have this global food system today with very high dependence. Um, Africa imports, as I said, 85% of its food. So we have to undo these structural traps that were introduced essentially on day one after independence, after yeah. supposedly the global south became independent. Same thing on the renewable energy front. We need transfer of technology not just monetary compensation for climate debt and colonial debt, but also transfer of technology, which means we have to deal with the intellectual property rights system. Um, you can even think of reparations for um, uh, biopiracy from the global south by pharmaceuticals. 
You, so we have to transfer technology to build resilient economies in the global south. And we have to okay. think of a different kind of industrialization, as Ndongo mentioned earlier, south-south strategic partnerships to build a different kind of uh, industrial system in the global south. Thank you, Fidel. So that's uh, definitely big challenges ahead uh, of us. And we take away as a movement that we need to act fast and uh, work on all of these different fields. Now, Esteban, um, I presume you wanted to uh, briefly reply before we move on uh, to some of the questions that we as Debt for Climate often get asked. Sure, because I think it's really important what Dongo and Fadel was were saying, um, and to to provide a perspective from how can we translate this, which is right, to grassroots power, which I think is the challenge we all have before us. I'm a scientist, and I have been greatly humbled by understanding by by learning from building and working with grassroots movements, and you know, school did not train us to build power. School did not teach us how strategy and tactics work to confront corporations and financial colonialism. So I think the challenge we have before us is we have excellent um, academic knowledge and diagnostics of the problems. How can we go from, as, as they both said, that consolation is not enough. It can only be a first step towards changing the system and changing the system of debt. In the global north, you always hear this demand for system change in the climate movement. But you also see, or I always see that not, nothing moves a step forward in that direction because no one has the answers for this. So in my view, and this is part of why we created that for climate is the, the, the perspective from the grassroots, from the bottom up, how can we build the necessary power we need to make the changes in, in the system that we that are necessary. And the only way to build that power is to start with milestones that are achievable. And when we made our diagnostics from a grassroots perspective, we see that debt is the most, is the weakest link in the chain of this. Canceling the debt, especially at a time after the pandemic, a debt crisis and everything that's happening is you know, the moral thing to do, the ethical thing to do, the scientific thing to do, to enable a just transition, to enable climate action. But that will lead nowhere unless you have built a powerful movement, which is what will make that happen. That same movement will be the one that will continue building and growing to enact the necessary changes to the system that are structural and which you cannot do any other way. If you expect the same people that are providing the free trade agreements and making them, as Father was describing, the climate finance, you, of course, they are, they are, all their initiatives are a fraud and timid at, at best at targeting anything like the climate crisis. So we know that the solutions will not come from any of the people in power. They will only come from the bottom up. And for that, we need to build power. And the process of building that power sometimes is a bit different from the academics, or unless we need to become experts on the academic knowledge of building power, of building, I think all of us as scientists, even if we come from biology like me or anything like that, we need to take on this challenge of how can we translate the truth and the science that we have into power on the streets, which is the only thing that changes the, part, the course of history. Thank you, Esteban, for that very valuable and important perspective. And this is exactly what we, we are intending to do also with this webinar, to bring together the very valuable expertise knowledge from both perspectives, from an academic and from an activist perspective. Now, I think for a lot of people, especially in the global north, who are um, not so much familiar with the whole topic of debt and sometimes even don't know what the IMF and the World Bank are, let alone the connection to climate crisis, um, they move to, to their head in order to see whether they are going to join a movement and whether they are going to, um, to join a coalition. And we get a lot of um, doubting questions, um, which I want to use the opportunity for today to provide those um, undoubted people basically to, um, to join this movement and to be reassured that they are doing the right things. So um, we received especially three questions that we received over and over again um, are the first thing is that people are worried in the global north that that constellation for the global south has tremendous detrimental economic consequences for economies in the global north like inflation um, so this would be I'm, I'm just going to um, 
to give you all the three questions and then you can you can pick the ones that you want to um, to respectively answer to. So the qu first question would be what would actually be the economic questions if uh, consequences, if any, be for the global north if the that of the global south would be cancelled. And then the second one that we often get is this question when you just look at the numbers to say, for example, oh, but Spain or Japan or the US, they are so indebted. So um, why are you not also uh, calling for that cancellation for Spain or the global F or, or or the United States. So what is maybe the difference? And I know you and Dongo have, have written quite a quite a bit about it. What maybe you can tell the people what the difference actually is for a country to be indebted in a foreign country a currency, not again repeating the mistake. Um, what is the difference um, to be indebted in, in foreign currency or in your own currency? And the third one is that we always get asked, um, since the IMF and the World Bank, they, they function as um, almost like a, like a corporation that, that governments or countries are shareholders, more or less, um, so that their power, their voting power is divided um, between the the large amount of or the the size of their their economies so what what can governments of the global north actually do um to get the debt cancelled um can they for example demand by themselves that they are going to cancel that debt or how can they actually influence or use their power in the imf to get the debt cancelled so i'm giving it over to to the three of you and maybe you can decide which question you would like to to answer whether to the question of foreign currency, the consequence, the economic consequences for the global north, um, and the power that um, governments can take to get the debt cancelled. Would like to go first. Well, I, I could go first. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I start by saying that Esteban is, is right in what he said earlier. Uh, generally, I mean, in the approach of, I mean, civil society organizations, movements, uh, there is this assumption that while well, with more knowledge, policymakers will change things. Sometimes you not face, I mean, a knowledge problem, but an interest problem. And when you face an interest problem, that means that you have to mobilize people to change that. So when you produce information, it's in that perspective of gathering people in order, I mean, to put pressure against, I mean, uh, vested interests that do not want change. So I would agree with that. Regarding the difference between having debt in national currency uh, and having debt in a foreign money unit of account, in fact, when you have uh, your own national currency, uh, while well, you have some, I mean, margin of monetary sovereignty, the sovereign debt, the debt issued by the state, is a net the net financial wealth of the non non government sector. I mean, it's the wealth, financial wealth created for, I mean, the, the companies, for uh, the households, for the rest of the world. So this debt is not an issue. That's why you could have uh, for Japan something like more than 250% of GDP. There is no financial crisis. There is no issue. No one <laughs> wants the debt in Japan to be cancelled, you know, because Japan is a sovereign currency issuer. And so what uh, an approach like MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, uh, shows you is that whatever uh, is available uh, for sale in your own unit of account, uh, you could afford it. For example, if developing countries, the Global South, they had a development model based on the res real resources they have available uh, domestically, or they could develop them domestically, for example, based on their land, on their expertise, on their workers, on the real resources they have, they, they would not need to issue debt in foreign currency to finance projects that relied on those local real resources. So that's the principle. But now when you issue debt in foreign currency, well, you do not, uh, I mean, you don't have as a government, the monopoly of the issuance of the foreign currency. So you have to uh, create uh, foreign earnings to repay the debt. Uh, you have either to attract foreign investment probably, but that's not a solution because the foreign investors, they will come to make a profit. So they will repatriate dividends and, uh, and profits. And that, that will not be a solution. Or what would happen is uh, you take more debt to repay the existing debt. So that means that uh, when you are in a pattern of vicious external indebtedness, well, it can't work. That means that you have to have another model based on your own domestic resources. Uh, but uh, if the current 
uh, outstanding uh, external debt stock, public debt stock of the Global South was to be cancelled, I mean, this would have no major impact, economic impact for the Global North countries. The impact that, uh, that, uh, that would be possible is a political economic impact in the sense that, well, if you, for example, you say uh, we don't want uh, to repay the debt owed to, to BlackRock, well, BlackRock will put pressure on the, I mean, on the uh, US governments and other OEC government to say that, well, uh, you have to put pressure on the Global South countries so that they repay the debt. But technically speaking, the Global North countries, for example, could well say that uh, we can sell the debt and we'll deal with BlackRock, for example, and this would not be an issue, I think. Thank you so much. What about you, Fadel? Would you like to jump in for the... Yeah, I'll, I'll address the issue of, uh, of inflation, this idea that <clears throat> canceling the debt in the global south will, will cause inflation or, or hyperinflation of some sort in the, in the global north. Well, number one, the inflation cycle that we're experiencing right now has nothing to do with, <clears throat> excuse me, canceling the, the debt of, of any country in the, in the global south. So we have to understand what actually causes inflation uh, in, in, in this system, say in a global north country like the United States. Uh, from, from my perspective, inflation happens when a country or a government is spending so much and going into deficit spending, government spending, and that deficit spending translates into income and purchasing power that creates demand in the economy that exceeds the productive capacity of the economy. In other words, when you run out of skilled labor, technology, raw materials, uh, productivity, logistics, supply chain disruptions, you create a, a situation where you have inflation pressure points. The good news about that type of inflation is that productive capacity is producible. We can build more productive capacity in renewable energy, in the food system, in public transportation, and create millions of jobs, and that actually tames the inflation pressure point. So with more strategic spending, to build the productive capacity needed for economic and ecological resilience, we can actually kill the source of inflation. And the second source of inflation, which is often ignored, is abusive market power. When you have multinational corporations that can actually raise prices simply because they can or because we let them, we have inflation. And we are experiencing this in the last two years since, since COVID. So that abusive market power that causes inflation, the only way to get rid of it is by taxing and regulating the abusive market power out of existence, applying and updating and enforcing antitrust laws. The problem is who's going to introduce that regulation? It's the lawmakers that we elect in parliaments and senates across the world. So here we're talking about the corruption of the political and economic system because they're not willing to bite the hands that feed them. From We're talking about politicians here. So this is fundamentally a question of democracy. Do we have governments of the people, by the people, for the people, or governments by the corporations and for the corporations? So tackling the corruption of the political and economic system, the monopoly power, the cartels that actually run the global economic system will help us address issues of inflation, will help us democratize economies across the world. So that's, to me, the issue of inflation. But inflation is also a question of loss of purchasing power, right? That's why people fear the issue of inflation. Well, let me tell you what's the biggest loss of purchasing power that we're facing is going to be. It's not related to spending on fighting climate change and all of that. If anything, not spending on fighting climate change is going to be the source of the biggest inflation in the history of the universe and the biggest source of loss of purchasing power. Uh, for workers, all of us in the global north and the global south, when you look at where your retirement money is invested, your pension fund, your university endowment, uh, your portfolio, if you're, if you're invested in any company, they're invested in assets that are packed with climate risk. We're talking here about stranded assets. We're talking about the carbon bubble, meaning if my university endowment is investing in companies that own hotels and resorts in coastal cities across the world, and those hotels will be flooded and will be impacted by climate change or invested in fossil fuel companies that will have 
trillions of dollars worth of stranded assets as we decarbonize the system, as we face much more severe impact of, of climate events, then those assets that are expected to generate returns to fund my retirement and your retirement and my university endowment, those assets will produce zero returns. And that's gonna be the biggest loss of financial assets in the history of the universe. And that's gonna be the biggest loss of people's retirements, of people's income in the future. And that's a loss of purchasing power that nobody's discussing today. If anything, mitigating climate change with the right action, spending strategically, doing the right thing to save the planet, to do the right thing will actually be the biggest investment in fighting inflation in the long term. Thank you for that perspective and that clarification. Um, but then maybe before uh, before I open the floor for the, the audience to ask their questions, so get your questions ready already. I'm just gonna briefly come back to you Ndongo because you made you um, touched on a very important topic, um, which is the difference between privately owned debt and publicly owned debt. Maybe you can just briefly explain um, or clarify what you meant with BlackRock and maybe briefly explain the role that BlackRock and other private institutions play in holding uh, Global South debt, just briefly. Yeah, in fact, you have uh, the, the debt of the Global South is, uh, oh, uh, I mean, is owed to three types of actors. You have the governments, you see, so that is um, uh, debt, uh, I mean, owed by one government vis-a-vis -vis another one. You have the debt owed to the, I mean, international financial institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, and so on. And you have now the debt, uh, I mean, owed to private creditors. So uh, before you had the debt owed by the to, to commercial banks, and more and more you have uh, debt uh, uh, owed to uh, eurobond holders. That means. Um, investor in uh, uh, foreign currency denominated bonds like uh, Black, BlackRock. And uh, BlackRock is an um, asset uh, management company, one of the biggest in the world, and which centralize a lot of, I mean, social and political power uh, worldwide. And uh, a company like BlackRock uh, 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 hold the debt of I mean, developing countries like Zambia. And those kind of creditors, generally, they are not willing to, to cancel the debt. It's really difficult because, uh, well, they are not obliged to sit at the table and uh, they could put pressure on the governments of the, I mean, the global North countries. And to some extent, this is a point uh, made by Fadel. If those government was less subject, I mean, to the pressure of uh, companies like BlackRock, probably we could have uh, found an issue because um, canceling the debt or to such uh, entities is not, I mean, it is affordable for the global North countries. But the thing is, will they do it? That's why we need a mobilization for that to, to happen. And often, yeah, the, 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 the interest rates on those uh, debt, the yields are really, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, exorbitant. And uh, yeah, that, that also says that, well, this is not a kind of legitimate debt to the extent that, well, it's predatory. Mm. Thank you for that clarification. Also, the interest, the interest payments is an important topic, right? That that is actually the uh, one of the ways how debt is used as a profit generating business for the global north. And if you calculate the whole interest payments that have been issued by the global south to the global north, the original debts have been repaid already multiple times. So this is something to keep in to keep in mind as well. Um, so this would be the point. Thank you so much for all your inputs. And I know that um, also thank you for the interpreter so far for translating this very economic languages. I hope they didn't struggle too much. You did a, probably a very, very good job until now. Um, so this would be the moment where um, the audience can, um, so all of everybody else who hasn't spoken yet, can ask questions and please ask basic questions, complicated questions, just everything that... Um, that comes to your mind that you need clarification for to join our very important mobilization to get the debt cancel and change the financial out, outlook of the global financial structures go ahead. Um, so I have Lubem who raised their, who raised their hand. Um, please feel free to ask your question if you want to put on your camera so we can see who asked the question. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, and everyone in the call. Uh, my name is Lubeme, and um, I'm calling from Abuja, the capital city of Nigeria. 
Uh, before I go ahead, I want to give a, a little background about myself. So that just, you may let me, sorry, Lubem, let me just uh, interrupt you for one second. It's a bit difficult to understand you. Maybe you can hold your microphone a bit closer to your uh, mouth or use headphones if you have some. Just it's easier for the interpreters to do that job if your, your sound that's is that's good. <laughs> okay, okay, that's fine. Can you hear me better now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for this very, very important call. And uh, I was saying that uh, before I go ahead with my comment, it's actually a comment. I want to uh, give you a brief about myself. I'm a political ba uh, scientist by training. Um, I'm a journalist by career. I publish a newspaper here in Abuja, the capital city of Nigeria. At a point, at a point I worked in the Chamber of Commerce in Nigeria. I worked in the presidency and currently, I worked in the Nigerian National Assembly, where I'm a, an assistant to a federal lawmaker. Now, the question of debt is something that has troubled a lot of us in, the, in this country. At various levels that have been privileged to work, we discuss this, and it's always a big problem. At a point in Nigeria, we, our debt was cancelled by one of our big sisters that worked in the World Bank. He was able to do that successfully, and all our loans in World Bank were forgiven. But if you ask me, 12 years after that, Nigeria has slumped deep into another, 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 another loan crisis. The president of Nigeria just last Friday presented our annual budget to the parliament, and about 40% of that budget is to be used for loan servicing. It's a big problem. And I look at it from three angles. One, there's an issue of corruption here involved, that even if you forgive all these debts, Nigeria is going to go back. Countries like Nigeria are going to go back into that debt cycle. Two, it's another question of indiscipline. And again, if you're not disciplined, you can't manage the much that you have. We have a lot of resources at our disposal in Nigeria, but the system is not disciplined enough to manage all this. Three, I go to the issue where uh, Fide talked about, and uh, almost everybody was fantastic in the presentation, that uh, corruption has taken over the system, and the leadership recruitment process is where the whole corruption starts. If you don't recruit a leadership from a very good perspective or from a nice tool, it will be difficult for you to have this. I just read the report and I shared on our, our signal platform where Kenya, is now fined in millions of dollars by China because they gave the loan to Kenya, Kenya defaulted. And it was viewed as a basic infrastructure like road, I mean, a railway. We have the same China problem in Nigeria. And if care is not taken, these assets are going to be confiscated by China. And that will take us to another round of colonialism. And so only time we discuss this, I feel that the structure should be basically on the leaders. And the leaders should also be held accountable. We should not be blaming only the Britain Wood institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, and all that. We should also hold our own people accountable. And that's why for us in Nigeria, for me, it's very, very important that we should amplify these voices. And we should use a global platform like this to do that. Because to protest is very, very dangerous and risky. So we can't go to that mind. So if there are any other innovative ways that you can help us that are activists here, to do that, it will be of great and uh, support to us. Thank you, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Lubem. You made some really important comments there um, to also remind us of the three different levels of indebtedness or on, on, in creditors, right? That is one multinational, multinational institutions, then we touched on the private sector, and then we cannot forget, of course, the country lenders such as um, China or India who are big lenders in this whole topic uh, and thank you for broadening the perspective again and it's exactly because we have to highlight these kind of topics that we are hosting these web webinars and having the mobilization of debt for climate to amplify exactly these points um, and to see also to build the power on the streets from the bottom up like Esteban said to hold the people in the global north accountable um, and th their governments accountable as well. Um, I see Elsa has the hand up so Please go ahead and, and ask your question. Uh, we can't hear you, or I can't hear you at least. Elsa, I have to interrupt you. 
No, we cannot hear you. No. Yes, now we can hear you. No, I can't. Wait. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you too. It was my headphones. Um, so I'm I'm from uh, the Debt for Climate Finland, um, and as was mentioned um, by someone earlier, these things are kind of new to many climate spaces in global north, and even many climate um, groups and even politicians. Like I'm sure not many politicians know about these things from a climate perspective. They might be worried about the economy, um, but I'm thinking. Um, my question to you is, I really appreciate it, the, um, um, the trade deficit explanation uh, that specified that there is uh, a lack of food sovereignty and that should be emphasized and kind of solved. Um, and then there is a structural trade deficit regarding energy as well as, well as um, this reliance on industrialization that is relying on extractivism and low value manufacturing. And I think I want to ask you tips uh, on how to kind of make this movement less only about economics, because I think that might be difficult to explain and relate to. Um, whereas I see a lot of people already talking about food sovereignty uh, in some spaces. And I think it would be a great thing to kind of invite them to join us because if we only talk about debt, um, it might kind of unite us all and it be a, a, like a very welcoming uh, and a good like common denominator, common denominator for people in global south, but for people in global north, um, everyday citizens and politicians and activists, I think I think it would be beneficial to kind of attract people through discussion about extractivism and those um, structural trade deficits. So I wonder if you have any plans to kind of do that in future or have any webinars or where you see we could kind of go from this a bit focused uh, campaigning, which I think is good, but we, we have to kind of go further uh, when we are attracting people to join the cause and create these big coalitions, as you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you also for that comment. Um, I think uh, maybe I give the perspective maybe of, of that for climate briefly, and then I give the word to, to Fadal and Dongo if they want to reply as well. Um, I think this is exactly what we are what we're doing with that for climate to connect those levels of how that is related to food sovereignty, for example, uh, to the connection, the relationship between that and extractivism. We have a, um, a very important figure in Argentina as well, who is working on the relationship between that and deforestation. So really showing how that is fueling exactly what you're saying. So this is the attempt to bring all like both sides, the economic side that is being neglected by the climate crisis and the climate movement that usually neglect the economic side um, to bring those two together uh, and have a, um, um, a merged movement basically um, that exactly cover both of the topics that are being neglected from the from the perspective respective sides. But this is just also the first uh, the first of in, in its as in its kind of the webinars that we're going to organize. So we definitely um, going to take that on. And then I, I see Esteban has his hand up, so I give you the word. And then uh, Fadel and Dongo, if you want to say something, you can also uh, put your hand up and then I see if you want to jump in or not. Thank you, Luis. I briefly wanted to comment about uh, Lubem, to respond to Lubem's comment, um, specifically when he mentions China, and to also give the perspective of why from Debt for Climate we have taken the agenda and the strategy that we have taken by targeting, beginning by targeting the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. They are not the only sources of financial colonialism. There is also all the private lenders like BlackRock, there is then state uh, lenders like China, but we have found that these are the weakest link in the chain again, where if we can build a global mass movement that can put pressure and build common sense, these are the institutions that are most broadly hated by everyone. It gives you a, an example that when you go to their building in Brussels or in many countries of Europe, you don't even find a sign 
they are hiding in plain sight. They are trying not to even show where they are because they know how, you know, they're trying to avoid visibility. So since these institutions are run by presumably democratic societies like the G7, which are also kind of leading the narrative of the climate fight of climate change, we thought this is the weakest link of the chain where if we build enough pressure, we can start to achieve some gains there and in the process build the necessary movement that can also tackle China and the private lenders because in the, it would be much harder to mobilize and put pressure on China, which is not responding to democratic pressure than it may be to put pressure in Germany and all these global North countries that are you know, uh, selling the idea that they are climate champions and that they care about the climate crisis. Just wanted to add that from the perspective of the campaign. Thank you for that um, for that explanation as well. And then I'll give the word to Fadel and we have the interpreters have to leave on time. Um, so maybe we have five more minutes um, to answer and maybe take one more question and answer. So go ahead, Fadel. Uh, very briefly on, on the issue of, of debt traps, I just put it in the chat here as a recent example in the news from Tunisia just a few days ago, um, a loan that is designed specifically to quote unquote help Tunisia deal with the, with the food crisis by essentially providing a loan to continue importing from the European Union. And it's marketed in, in the press by governments as a loan to improve food resilience in Tunisia. And it's specifically a loan to buy more from the European Union as opposed to invest in food sovereignty and production of strategic crops uh, in Tunisia like wheat and, uh, and, and barley and things like that. So uh, the examples abound that the intervention from the global north to quote unquote help in times of crises is never designed to address the roots of the problem, but it's designed to put a Band-Aid on the problem and keep the same extractive system in place. Thank you. Um, I will just take one question from the chat before, uh, let's see if we don't have time for your question, Cesar. Um, Renata from uh, Panama asked, um, if one of you could briefly touch on the debt situation of countries of the global south that use US dollars, as for instance, is the case of Panama. Panama is described as being critically indebted. The country is facing multiple climate impacts and has taken up loans for climate adaptation. I'm interested to understand how Panama using US dollars makes our situation different from countries using their own local currencies. So I leave it up to you who would like to answer whether Fadel or Ndongo, maybe um, you would like to, to take that on. Uh, well, I do not know the situation of Panama well, but uh, a point could be made about the, um, uh, the dollarized currencies. That means uh, countries using, uh, I mean, the currency of another country. Uh, I, I was lucky to talk to an Argentinian economist, post-Canadian economist, and who told me, Nongo, you know, this foreign debt issue in Latin America, it concerns basically three countries. There is obviously Argentina for historical reasons, but you have two dollarized countries, Ecuador and also El, El Salvador. Uh, so when you do not have your own national currency, while well, you have no monetary sovereignty at all, and this compounds your economic uh, uh, strategies. So you have very limited margins to have, let's say, a national development policy that could bring, I mean, prosperity to your country. So those countries are particularly exposed to debt in, in foreign currency because they don't have any monetary sovereignty at all. Uh, that's why it's important against the neoliberal myth of uh, global South countries lacking money to uh, have a good idea about how the monetary system works. As long as the uh, um, global South countries uh, have the real resources available, there are things they could do without needing to, uh, I mean, to attract foreign debt investment or issue debt in, in foreign currency. Uh, my last point is also about the issue of debt reputation, because when we talk about debt cancellation, it's like a creditor perspective that the creditor cancels the debt, but there are also legal resources that the global South countries could use to repudiate the debt, especially when they are odious. They could demonstrate that they are just. Yes. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, th this also shows how how important it is that we also unite movements in the global north and in the global south, right? Because their their role in fighting for that constellation and transforming the financial system is just very different, and the the influences that they can take is are just really different. Um, Cesar, I, I see your hand up, and maybe you will have the last the last question. Go ahead. Um, in case you're speaking, you're still muted, so we can't hear you, Sisa. Hola. Hi. Me es, puedo hablar en español, sí, me dicen. Um, so if, you can uh, speak in Spanish. I can speak in Spanish, right? Don't speak Spanish. You can change now into the English channel to understand the question. Go ahead, Cesar. Sí. Okay. <laughs> eh, okay. It was just mentioned, I'm in Colombia and we talked about the world economy. We have a specific perspective on debt. For us, it doesn't seem logical that the global north would say, you know what, debt is canceled, We, you don't owe us anything. Why do we say that? Because if they were to accept that deal, they will have internal problems. They won't be able to um, provide resources and food that we are currently sending from the global south. In the north, they are usually people are accustomed to seeing us as slaves, right? And so they will realize if they cancel the debt, they're not going to have any food. And so this idea of canceling the debt is not going to be so simple because the reality of everything is that they are fed with the food that we send. And so we don't see that as... If you still want an answer to your question, you just have to keep it short because we have like three minutes left maximum for an answer. So. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. Eh, entonces, entonces quiero, quiero preguntarles and a los so here's the question for the economists. I, I want to, you know, are you aware of that? Politicians, economists, uh, maybe it's not actually possible that they will decide to cancel the debt or that they say, you know what, we're not going to cancel the debt. So what do we do when that happens? I would like to give a, a brief answer to that, to that question. Uh, I can I can give a a brief uh, comment on on this. You're absolutely right. I mean that's why we're talking about investing in food sovereignty, investing in energy sovereignty, renewable energy sovereignty as the basic foundations of any economy. No economy can function without food, without energy, and that is true both for the global south and the global north. Now that is true for some countries in the global south. They're major exporters like. Uh, uh, Argentina and, and Brazil, for example, of, of food. But the majority of the global south are actually importers of food because we lost our food sovereignty and importers of energy. Even for a country like Nigeria that exports a lot of fossil fuels, it actually imports its uh, some of its fuel. Uh, Mexico, a big OPEC country, is importing 50% of its gasoline from the United States. So these relationships require, uh, I mean, the, the transition that we're talking about requires restructuring economies both in the global south and in the global north to rebalance the production of food, to rebalance the production of, of energy in every country on the planet. And it's the responsibility of the global north to lead the world in repairing the damage that they caused. I mean, just to put it on, on in, in very blunt in, in, in clear terms, uh, if we're going to meet the climate challenge by 2030, by 2040, to, to, to meet the 1.5 degree or the 2 degree even uh, limit, we have to phase out fossil fuels immediately as we speak. But what we have is the top 10 oil and gas companies in the world are planning to add a trillion dollars worth of new infrastructure over the next 10 years. And this is signed, sealed, delivered contract, it's going to happen, which means they're taking us to climate extinction. So what we're talking about here is one of two things. For the oil and gas executives and the prime ministers and governments that actually sign these deals and give them the licenses to do this, they're doing one of two things. 
They're just either signing our. You very briefly, Fadel, yeah. because I'm just having to look at, at the time, and we have you have maybe a seven. Yeah, has just one up, sentence. So just, yes, yeah. thank you. Sorry. They're they're doing one of two things. They're either signing our collective suicide pact because we know what this will lead to, or they're duping investors by selling them stranded assets, which is financial fraud. Either way, it has to be treated as criminal activity, and we have to organize and mobilize people accordingly in the global north and the global south to deal with this criminal activity that's taking place right now. Thank you. And Esteban, you can have the final word if you like. Yeah, no, just uh, less than a minute to answer Cesar uh, in Spanish. Uh, Cesar, de lo que estabas diciendo, una cosa que te quería decir, yo no soy economista. I wanted to answer in Spanish. I'm not an economist. You, you know, you, talk, you asked the economists, but from our organization, we're not trying to beg politicians from the north to cancel the debt. We want a grassroots movement here in the south, here in the north. And so if we can unite, you know, Colombia, Argentina, many countries from this from the south to engage in civil disobedience and not pay their debt and then force the IMF and the World Bank to come to the negotiating table and annul and cancel the illegitimate debts, uh, then that's what we want to do. Well, thank you. I think that's a beautiful end note. Um, this was a very intense and multifaceted conversation, I would say. So uh, what we take away is we can cancel the debt, it's affordable, and it's a necessary first step to really change uh, the whole system and reverse the flow of resources and wealth from the south to the north. But to do that, we need to build power in the streets with workers, indigenous movements, and the climate justice movement. And we hope that this webinar was one of many steps in that direction. So uh, I really want to thank Dongo, Fadel, and Esteban for joining this conversation. Thank you, Luis, uh, for co-moderating this. And finally, really importantly, thanks a lot to our translators who have tirelessly worked. Many thanks to Patricia. And uh, thank you very much to Lilu. Many thanks to Lilu. And Melissa Many thanks. and Laura, who translated uh, from French to English and uh, between English and Spanish. And that would be it. Um, we will publish the recording of uh, this webinar. So uh, Emmanuel from Ghana, who asked uh, about this, you will be able to find it. Um, just follow our Twitter, I would suggest, uh, for the final link. I think they, you, yeah, you can just check out our YouTube channel. We will up, upload it there as soon as we got there. So maybe we subtitle it, it will take a while, but um, just follow our YouTube channel and there you will see it. So thank you. Thanks a lot also from my side, also to Christopher for the wonderful moderation and to the panelists for sticking to the time uh, as well that we set. And um, to all the people who recorded, please don't forget to save the recording and send it to me so that we can uh, upload the video. And with that, 4.30 um, would be the end of it. Thank you so much for coming, joining, asking questions and speaking. Thank you. It's been an honor. Dongo, Fadel, see you soon. See you, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Same here. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Appreciate it. It's very.